Good evening and welcome to the May 26, 2020 meeting of the East Long Meadow Town Council. We will uh, begin the meeting now with a moment of silence. And during that time, we ask you to continue to keep our servicemen and women, our first responders and our public officials and health officials uh, as they deal with the uh, pandemic decisions that need to be made. Thank you. In accordance with uh, Mass General Law, this meeting is being audio taped and videotaped. This is a webinar. Uh, if there is anyone in our viewing audience who might be uh, doing the same, would you kindly identify yourselves? Mr. Quimby, do you see anybody there? I do not. Okay, then we can move on to public comments. Um, Jeannie, do we have anyone that we are aware of that has asked to, she's on mute. Sorry about that. No, not that I'm aware of. Nobody signed up for public comment. Ryan, not, nobody in the audience. Um, Jeannie, do we have anyone that we are aware of that has asked? I uh, do not see anybody in the attendance uh, raising their hand. Okay, then we can move to council comments. And I would like to um, make a comment this evening, uh, and it regards um, actions taken against one of our town small businesses over the past few weeks by our health department. Unfortunately, it has yielded an unusual public outcry. Uh, in order to explain the reasons behind the health department's uh, decision to issue a fine, it's important, I think, for the viewing audience and the public to understand the chronology of events. And they began on May the 7th, and I'm just going to briefly summarize. When the owner of this particular small business uh, reached out by email to our health department, asking for direction on when uh, he would be able to reopen his particular business. The health di director uh, notified him within minutes of uh, the governor's orders and um, also provided a link to the various websites so that he could see the written order itself in the various phases, as well as uh, the local guidelines on enforcement. What ensued over the, the uh, remainder of May 7th was a volley of emails back and forth between um, our health department and the owner, where on two occasions, the owner asked, could he uh, open this particular aspect of his business? And the answer continued to be, uh, no, it is not regarded at this time by the governor as an essential uh, business and had to remain closed. And he was also told that per the governor's orders at that time on May 7th, that the type of business he was running was projected to be included in phase two. At that point on May 7th, the uh, email interaction concluded. On May 22nd, our health inspector was called by the fire department to uh, join them at a, a scene of uh, a residence in East Long Meadow that required the attention and uh, decision making of uh, someone from the health department. When that event was over, uh, on her way home, the health inspector, on her way out of town, uh, by happenstance passed by the particular business and observed that it in fact was open. She notified the health director of that observation and the health director checked online to make sure that there hadn't been an update that day that would have relaxed the guidelines around this particular business being closed. When it was determined that the business was still regarded as non-essential, the uh, health director instructed the health inspector 
to issue a cease and desist order, which is accompanied as well with a $300 fine. And that was delivered with uh, the assistance of the East Long Meadow Police Department. On, um, I actually on my notes, I, I'm not looking at the proper date, so I don't wanna say, but subsequent to May 22nd. Uh, as a result of the deliverance of that fine, the owner of the business did comply with the order. Well, what has ensued since is very troubling uh, because the uh, public outcry has risen beyond what you would think would be normal discourse among respectful citizens. It has resulted in allegations of uh, potential harm directed at the health director and her family. Uh, she's been the subject of harassment inflammatory and uh, insensitive pictures, uh, none that can necessarily be authenticated. Uh, with the uh, advancements in technology today, it's very easy to alter uh, an image and make it appear to be something it isn't. The purpose of my uh, going to this kind of detail is to remind the public that uh, as counselors, we have an obligation to uphold the health, safety, and welfare of all of our residents. And that applies to businesses. But we also have an obligation for our employees to do their job and to carry out, in this case, the health departments across the Commonwealth are tasked with the enforcement of the governor's orders, whether they like it or whether they agree with it or not, that is not the case. And the responsibility to safeguard the safety and welfare of our residents extends as well to our employees. And for that reason, this council will stand behind our health director in that she was doing her job, she was carrying out the uh, orders of the governor, uh, consistent with the guidelines, and she did take her due diligence to, on um, two occasions in writing via email, to alert the business owner. Uh, this is not to portray that this town is anti-business. To the contrary, it is not. What it needs to portray is the uh, rules apply to everyone, and they must be meted out in an equitable manner. And so going forward, uh, our hope is that as we all struggle with the various phases and the hoped for relaxation of uh, some of the uh, parameters that we've all had to live under, I would simply ask that our residents be mindful of their obligation to be respectful. You don't have to agree with the decision, but you have an obligation as a citizen to be respectful about how uh, your opinion is expressed. And that is as far as I want to take this statement. Is there anyone else on the council who would like to comment this evening? Mr. Anderson. It, you know, I, I echo your remarks. I mean, calling for harm to uh, someone doing their job, uh, an official, is, is uncalled for. But one thing I want to remind ourselves as we move forward. Somebody once told me an old adage, it says don't attribute to malice, which could be attributed to something else. And maybe in this time where there is such a blurred line in enforcing these and understanding the governor's guidelines and regulations, and believe me, there is a bl blurred line. Perhaps one warning is not enough and not to attribute malice. There's another circumstance that I brought to the council president's attention of another small business that also has received a cease and, not a cease and desist order per se, but a $300 fine, which again, if the small business owner's facts I, can be taken as accurate, and I have no reason to believe such, it was merely a situation where it appeared he was open for business, when in reality, he wasn't. And I don't believe there's any interpretation that a business owner can't be inside their business and conduct a different form of the business and the vis-a-vis -vis 
uh, acting like Amazon or so forth and not engage in the public. So I think there needs to be perhaps a better understanding of small business and how they're run and perception may not necessarily be a reality. And again, I want to underscore attacks on our health, uh, threatened attacks on our health director or any employees or any other uh, you know, first responder, police department or anyone else, it's just really uncalled for. However, I do think that maybe this is an opportunity to have even a greater understanding of how businesses are trying themselves to try to cope in a responsible way. And maybe there is a little more um, understanding that can be brought to the table. Thank you for um, bringing that up. Um, as late as 3.30 this afternoon, um, I took a call from our uh, chair of the Board of Health, Dr. Sarah uh, perez uh, it saying that, or asking, what did I feel they, they as the uh, Board of Health, could do to assist the, the health department employees as well as the town management to uh, work with businesses to make sure they truly understood. Because uh, the guidelines, is, though they're well written and they're, they're for the most part uh, in straightforward language meant for the user, there's still a, a challenge in the interpretation of the guidelines. Uh, and there, uh, and there, it always begs, you know, the opportunity for two different individuals to look at it in two entirely different ways. But to that end, uh, what may very well happen in the next week or two is uh, the Board of Health with the uh, health director, uh, perhaps putting together a webinar of sorts and inviting. Uh, all of the small businesses in town to join in and have uh, this type of discussion where everybody can be heard. And if there's clarifying points that need to be made, all of the uh, health officials will be uh, available for that. This town is very fortunate in that our board of health is, is uh, a three member board and we are more than uh, fortunate that all three of our people are medical professionals and by f are extremely dedicated individuals. So uh, I, I'm very comfortable that with their help and with um, uh, the health director's help that we can get this webinar off the ground sooner than later and, and uh, in a show of support to businesses, uh, try to enlist their help or and their questions so that we can work together to go forward in the subsequent phases of uh, the governor's reopening of the state. Mr. Henry. Thank you, Kathy. I was online at eight o'clock in the morning following the announcement. And there, there was, I was online basically defending, Mer uh, defending uh, Amy and defending what yes. the town did and pointing out the fact that people did not have information. One of the things that I noticed was that people were all blaming the council. Well, except for those that were blaming the selectmen. <laughs> and I don't think, uh, just for the purposes of people who are watching, I want to point out that the council is not involved directly at this point because under the governor's order, the executive of the town takes over, which is the health department, the town manager, and the emergency manager. Right. It doesn't mean that the council ceases to exist, but insofar as decisions are made in terms of COVID-19 and, and those issues, that the power, the control, the decision-making is in the hands of the town manager and the health director rather than us. Uh, for anything else, it's, it's, we're still here and obviously we're, uh, we're interested and we're supportive. And like I say, I spent a lot of time trying to tamp down the fires. Exactly. Yeah. Appreciate that. Anyone else? Yeah. Thank you. Um, I just have a concern um, after reading through everything that the cease and desist order was given at the same time as a fine. I go back to our, um, uh, my planning board days with the building inspector who often had to give a cease and desist order. 
but he always gave the cease and desist. And then if they continued, he would come back and reinspect and then issue a fine. Um, I'm just looking for consistency throughout all the boards. Um, I, I think a cease and desist would have worked. Um, I, I mean, we all know the Fisk family. We know Fenway Golf. Um, and, and we know how important businesses are. And, you know, it's a tough time. Um, so I just think consistency within the boards would uh, definitely make a, a better aspect of this. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? Don. Maybe, maybe as a, a thought of everyone understanding the process, we all, all of us, I mean, the whole town, business owners, and I'm a small business, own two small businesses, is maybe rip up the ticket, return the $300, the message was delivered. I mean, I know one of the tickets for another business is going up on appeal. So we're gonna have to dedicate police officer resources and so forth on that appeal. And to me, it's not, I think, I think the message has been delivered. I think there's a spirit of cooperation. We have fine, fine businesses here in East Longmeadow. And they all, you know, are trying to work and find strategies to work. I don't think there's any, um, you know, any, anyone intentionally trying to break the law. I think it was obviously clear misunderstanding. And I think that, that you know, again, we don't, I don't think we have control as a council, but if we, as a recommendation, that is my recommendation. I don't think that's unfair. And I think that's a, a, a suggestion that we can uh, tip toward our manager to have with our health department around um, two things, consistency and uh, maybe a separation perhaps of the cease and desist order and followed in a reasonable amount of time uh, with the fine if the particular business fails to cooperate. But those are conversations that are, can be left with the manager and the health department, but I think they're all good ones. And I also want to say, because I meant to say this right from the beginning, this particular business is very, very supportive of the town of East Longmeadow. It's a longstanding business, it's a family run business. And during our 125th uh, celebration last year, they were very, very accommodating uh, in lending uh, use of their facilities to the town to, to run a, a, an event for children. And uh, by way of donating their time and their resources have con continued to show their support of the town. So in fairness to them, I, they deserve to, those kudos to be heard. Okay, then I think if there's nothing else, we can move on to town manager's report. Ta-da. So uh, your comments are noted and they've already been considered and progress hopefully will be made tomorrow on uh, some of the issues that you've just been discussing. <clears throat> since, um, since we last met, there have been additional guidance uh, provided by the Secretary of the Administration and Finance regarding the CARES funding that, it, that the Town of East Longmeadow is eligible for. It's a, it's a distribution of $2.7 billion that went to Massachusetts to be determined or distributed to the various cities and towns in the Commonwealth uh, on a per capita basis. So East Long Meadow is entitled to $1,436,000 in change. And uh, the application for the drawdown of those funds has to be made by June 5th. So I've asked all the department heads to advise me by tomorrow as to what their uh, anticipated COVID-19 financial needs are. The restrictions on these funds are that they have to be for COVID-related expenses only, unbudgeted, and they have to be incurred between March 1st and December 31st of 2020. And there's no um, double dipping per se, so that any funding or any expense that can be funded or reimbursed by FEMA is, cannot be used they cannot use the CARES funding for it. The reason they're rolling it out almost just by request is they don't want the communities to have to wait 
for the FEMA reimbursement, which sometimes is a year to 18 months. I want to have the money available and then we'll do the accounting after the fact. So once the money is received in town, it has to be set up in a, in a trust account essentially and all the accounting, if, if in fact certain expenses are reimbursable by FEMA then, and we've already paid for them from the CARES funding, then we'll have to reimburse one entity or the other. But it's a godsend currently because it will allow us to make all the precautions, take all the precautions that we need to eventually reopen the town hall and make the offices compliant with the various uh, restrictions that are new that are being placed on us as any as part of the normal business structure in the Commonwealth. So that's the very good news. Um, and I'm looking forward to receiving those funds so that we can go ahead and, and make our workspace safe. Um, we do continue to try to work with all the state agencies regarding enforcement uh, of these uh, governor's orders and advisories. It's not easy. The Board of Health is actually, uh, or our town employees in the health department, I think are overwhelmed because they're charged with the enforcement of every advisory and order that comes from the governor's office. And if there's any dispute about it, they stand alone. And they are subject to, as council president and several others of you have pointed out, um, vilification online that is just not tolerable. And uh, every single week they get a new obligation. Just today, the commissioner of uh, the Department of Education, of Elementary and Secondary Education came out with new guidelines regarding graduation ceremonies. And the boards of health are supposed to be the enforcement agents for all of those festivities across the Commonwealth. Well, we've got one inspector and one director. That's it. And so to enforce social distancing, uh, gatherings of less, of fewer than 10 people, uh, and adding the whole graduation piece to their current responsibilities is, is a huge task. The next phase of the governor's reopening deals with uh, recreation and outdoor activities, camps for children. Board of Health is responsible for enforcing all of those regulations and restrictions. So their responsibilities are enormous and they are, they are functioning under enormous pressure, trying not to alienate anyone uh, and do the right thing at the same time. So I'm happy to hear your support for them because it's, it's more than justified. Um, as the reopening phases continue, I fear that the boards of health are going to be given added responsibilities. So I think this situation may get a little worse um, before it gets better. On the financial side, we continue to work on our capital planning and financial oversight. As you know, the state still has not passed a budget for fiscal 21. And there's really no likelihood that it will until at least August, from what I understand. So we continue to do our best to pair expenses and estimate resources in the hopes that we can perhaps file a balanced budget by June 30th but the last advisory from the Finance Oversight Committee, I think they're of the opinion that we might take advantage of this 112th budgeting process um, that's available to us. So that topic is still under discussion. Um, departments within the town hall and others continue to work remotely. Uh, effective Wednesday, um, the library will be uh, returning, oh, that's tomorrow actually, will be returning staff um, to the site to prepare for the curbside delivery. The director told me today she thought she was going to need approximately two weeks to get ready. I mean, the, the detail of preparation is remarkable. They have to actually quarantine materials as they're distributed and returned to the library. So your books and DVDs have to go into quarantine for three days after they're returned by the public. Um, and the staff has to be six feet apart and there has to be sanitization and they have to do a self-attestation report indicating that they're in compliance with all of these phased reopenings and we're limited to 25 percent occupancy of any particular office in the town so there's a lot to factor into this there's a lot to take care of the devil's in the details as the saying goes 
And whoever said that first was quite correct. Um, so we're gonna continue to work remotely in our administrative offices as much as possible. And I've also authorized staggered work shifts and rearrangement of internal office spaces to allow hopefully for the return of some furloughed employees who um, are anxious to return to work and yet can't because they're in an office where they're closer than six feet to their coworker or um, they just don't have the precautions in place to allow safe distancing and therefore they can't come back to work. That's one reason. Um, we're trying to discuss those things with the union. I'm not imposing anybody to work a second shift, but if you can get some hours and come back to work and help with your department by working, you know, two to eight, then I'm not opposed to that if somebody chooses to do that. Um, we do continue to work with our health department again on the combined health initiative with the town of Longmeadow. There's an, in, an intermunicipal agreement that's been drafted and reviewed, and hopefully I'll get that for your review sometime in June. Other than that, we continue our regular uh, emergency operations calls. They've now been reduced to once a week internally. Uh, the webinars are nonstop. There's one tomorrow uh, with respect to your points about small business. The next phase of the governor's reopening calls for uh, outside dining. And there's a great deal of concern about whether the special permitting process can be relaxed, whether space for alcohol uh, service can be expanded beyond what the license currently allows for. There's legislation pending. There's a hospitality work group at the state level. And there's a webinar tomorrow morning um, with is going to have, I guess, some, some tips as to how to assist businesses to get ready. We've had a lot of calls, ask, people asking, well, what do I need to do? We're hesitant to give advice at this point because the guidelines haven't been issued, and I don't want to give advice to business owners and have the governor contradict that and have people make preparations that turn out to be either unnecessary or insufficient. Um, we're now 10 weeks into this COVID life and the, we're all anxiously awaiting some return to pre-COVID status, but the anticipation and the anxiety creates new problems for all of us daily. And uh, we continue as a town community, at least within the town hall staff, to advocate for patience and understanding and deferral of gratification because we all can't get what we want immediately. And it's important to recognize that and to know that everybody's got needs, but there's enormous suffering there. We're about to pass 100,000 deaths. So um, we try to keep our perspective, especially on this Memorial Day weekend. So that's my report for this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for Mary? Through the chair? Yeah, sure. Um, Mary, I have two questions. Um, it seems like months and months ago, uh, we ordered the top of the line disinfectant. Did that ever come in and are we using it? <laughs> or was that put on the back burner because oh, no. everyone we was authorized it? No, it was authorized and it was ordered and it was expected. And then I was told by the um, uh, Chief Morissette that the manufacturer of it had been delayed and the delivery of it was delayed. So the last I knew we had not received it. Uh, that, may, that information may be updated though uh, once I talk to Chief Morissette. I would think that would come in very handy with the reopening of the different town offices yes. and all. So hopefully yes. the timing works. Um, my other question to you is with regards to the proposal for the health department uh, partnership with Long Meadow. Um, I'm still concerned um, as far as the financials and all, will that be included in any uh, paperwork that we receive in the future? Yes, uh, the town manager in Longmeadow was submitting her budget with respect to the health initiative to the Board of Selectmen um, for their review to the Board of Health over there and the Board of Selectmen, and then it had to go to their town meeting. They're basically gonna pay 50 cents. They're gonna pay all of the expenses that Longmeadow incurs 
and all the responsibility will be shifted over to East Long Meadow. And that's super simplification. But in terms of the dollars per se, I can't tell you what they are. I don't have that file with me. But the sharing of expenses is going to be 50 50. And everything that we assume that they're currently pay for, paying for, they will have a budget line item for that that'll come over to us. Okay. I'm just, like I said, um, I'm concerned. I want to make sure that this is good for the town of East Long Meadow. Um, oh, yeah. I think that's our, our main thing. I don't want to see, I mean, I would think our budget for the health department would decrease because with Long Meadow uh, paying a portion of it, that our actual costs would go down. Um, and again, that's all I'm looking for is just the figures so that we can make sure it's good for our town. Absolutely. Um, I appreciate that concern that you have. And um, before anything is presented to you, we'll fully vet it and have all the dollars and cents itemized so that you can make an evaluation uh, or suggestions about it. Great, thank you. Other questions for Larry? Okay, thank you. Uh, we are moving on to number six, approval of minutes. And we have on the agenda the May 12th, 2020 open session minutes. Uh, I'm going to entertain a motion to table that for this evening because due to some computer glitches uh, with Jackie's computer, they are not available for us tonight. So um, can someone uh, table those? Jackie, is it reasonable to assume you'll have them ready for the next meeting? Yeah. Good. So moved. Motion, Second. Motion's been made and seconded to table the May 12th uh, minutes until the June 9th uh, meeting. Ms. Richards? Yes. Mr. Page? Yes. Mr. Anderson? Yes. I am a yes. Mr. Kane? Yes. And Mr. Henry. Yes. And that motion passes 6-0. Okay, under communication, correspondence, and announcements, uh, a very positive and uplifting uh, opportunity for us here, and that is the naming of the pool at the Pine Knoll Recreation Area to the Coach Charles E. Sylvia Pool. And with us this evening, I'm told that we have a member of Mr. Sylvia's family with us now who will join our conversation. Ryan, is that correct? Uh, yes, you just raise your hand in the uh, audience. I can pull you in. It's Susan, right? Susan Lang, yes. Yeah. You got her. There we are. There we go. Good evening, Ms. Lang. Um, Hi. Thank, you, thank you for joining us uh, this evening. Um, for the benefit of our viewing audience, in the last maybe six to eight months, the, the council uh, and the town has adopted a, a policy for the, excuse me, naming of various facilities around town. And uh, that said, uh, we've had multiple uh, interest from various uh, residents and long-time uh, participants in the Pine Knoll program to uh, rename this Pine Knoll pool in honor of uh, Coach Sylvia. So, Ms. Lang, you're here on behalf of the family this evening, and I'm going to turn the uh, floor over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. My husband, Dave, is here, and he and I uh, ran Pine Knoll together, with, along with my father, for probably the last 20, 25 years that we owned it. Um, I, I'm not sure if Ryan is going to show you the PowerPoint. Oh, good. So last October, we... Uh, put this together so that the Recreation Commission could see what the history of Pine Knoll was. And there are my mother and father. The property was purchased in the fall of 1957. 
and the red house was there. A backyard pool was there, and you'll see, well, there's the driveway. Um, that was probably in the spring of 58, maybe. And uh, there's a winter view looking from the house, which is now the parking lot, which has remained the same. And yeah, there's the house again. So what's remaining is that was the dining room and that's the meeting hall there now. So that, um, that is what's currently there now. So my father, uh, there were, as you can imagine, a lot of permission and with the town of East Long Meadow and the house and the driveway and all of that front is Springfield, as you know. And then there were about six acres in East Long Meadow. And my dad did purchase um, what is now the soccer field from Jean Wisbicki, Bluebird Acres. I'm sure some of you remember Bluebird Acres. Um, so he took out all of his retirement. Uh, he borrowed $10,000 from two friends. Each were doctors from Longmeadow, Dr. Bob Emery and Dr. John Priblo on a handshake. Paid them back in due time and had this dream of conducting a swim school, teaching beginning swimming and proper stroke technique to competitive swimmers. In 1956, my father was the one of the assistant uh, Olympic swimming coaches in um, Melbourne, Australia, oh. and had the only swimmer, Dr. Bill Yorzik, uh, win the gold medal that year. So pretty much put Springfield College on the map because he was the swimming coach there for 41 years. So, um, so in the spring of 58, the big pool was built. Many of you probably, so this on the left is the backyard pool and they raised the walls to make the diving pool. So there were two pools when East Long Meadow purchased the property in May of 1996. And that's what the gunite pool looked like. Um, then the locker rooms, you know, are still there and so forth. And at the end of the deep end, that was the filtration room, which I believe is, is still there for the new pool. And that was the tree that the uh, SIS bank gave my parents when they took out the mortgage. <laughs> so that was always a, a nice reminder of, um, their incredible hard work and my father's uh, dream and tenacity to take such, such a risk um, during that time. I was only five years old when we moved there. So, and this was our first summer. <laughs> and actually there are some, there are some East Long Meadow people here, uh, Charlie Gray, if you remember Charlie Gray, he was on the East Long Meadow Commission. He's there. Uh, Dick Gray, who doesn't live in East Long Meadow, but a lot of these kids were. Um, I'm in the front row there somewhere. <laughs> and a lot of the uh, people that worked at Pine Knoll started as children and worked their way up. Um, Here's a couple of his books that he wrote, Life Saving and Water Safety Today. Um, and, you know, we taught a lot of those skills too. So he wrote this book and it was used by the YMCA for years and years and years. Um, he spoke on life saving and water safety and uh, Dave and I, you know, continued in his footsteps, so to speak, uh, continuing to teach swimming. Dave is the swimming and diving coach at Westfield State. So, and then I think there's another picture. Oh, there's the Pine Knoll song, of course. My mother uh, wrote the lyrics. <laughs> so, 
So we used to sing that, have the kids learn it and so forth. And this was early on, um, one is a neighbor. And these were some of the kids that came free that year. And actually when we cleaned out and Dave and I brought probably 60 boxes here to our home in Wilbraham when we moved, uh, the accountant said, you have to bring the last 10 years. So we did. And one of the years I found, and there were 62 scholarship kids that came. So my father and mother really uh, walked the walk and talked the talk in terms of uh, giving and giving back. But these are, so yeah, there he is. This is in the 60s. Um, and we really prided ourselves on stroke technique. You can see that young man helping a child exactly, not only where the hand goes or the feet or the stroke, but why. Why, why is the human motion like this and why does it succeed in terms of stroke technique? So there he is when he was inducted into the International Swimming Hall of Fame. And there's Bill Yorzik next to him in the dark jacket. And there's Art Linkletter on the other side because uh, Art Linkletter gave, what was it? 800,000 to Springfield College for the new pool to be built. And this was back in 68, I think. And he and my father actually swam a race was sort of a, you know, to get everybody excited. Uh, there's Bill Yorzik and then another swimmer of my father's, Jack Nelson. They went to the Olympic trials and, and all this, you know, was happening at Pine Knoll too, because a lot of these people trained at Pine Knoll. And we always had a Saturday morning program where parents could bring their child and then with our instructors actually go through what they learned that week and so forth. Um, and, you know, we felt that that was important. This is a Saturday, there I am right there, a lot younger. And there's my father and uh, you can see the, the orange egg. My father invented, a lot of people call him the bubble but the Sylvia egg. And uh, we taught a very non-traumatic approach. Uh, children were not pulled underwater. The face was not forced underwater. And I can tell you from many years of experience of teaching swimming to typically developing children and children with special needs that it works. It displaces about as much water as a submerged head, so you can learn all the strokes and never put your face in. And all children will eventually put their face in the water. And then you can teach proper breath control. But if you frighten them, then you know, you're taking 10 steps back. So my husband Dave is here. So we had a boarding program. We had a sleepover program. Competitive swimmers came. My father had an underwater housing built so Dave could film the, film the stroke underwater and on top of the water, and then during the week critique their stroke. Mon Monday was always dolphin butterfly day, Tuesday backstroke, et cetera. So that's the, and there was a lot of science. Kids learned, and maybe you heard and read in some of the letters that were written in support that, you know, they never forgot certain muscles and bones and, there was a lot to it. It wasn't just Archimedes, Sir Isaac Newton, Sir Isaac Newton. Mm -hmm. a lot of science. And it's really interesting because I have taught some of the children of the children that came and, you know, uh, for them to talk about stories and so forth. And then in 1970, he wrote this manual that had a lot in it, basic swimming, water stunts, life-saving, springboard diving. And it was used in colleges all over the country because there were lesson plans in it. So this was a reunion that we had. And a lot of these guys, when they were swimmers at Springfield College, were staff members at Pine Knoll. So some would bring their families like these gentlemen here, Lee Lawrence from 
Naval Academy, Tom Grawl, there's Dave and me, Bill Lawson from Lafayette. So they would come along with these guys and rent homes somewhere in East Longmeadow and work for us. Their children came and then they would house the boarding students that uh, we didn't have room for. So um, then we started a swim team. And here's our swim team that year. That was probably, I don't know, 80 something. Pine Knoll also got an award from the American Academy of Physical Education. And we, um, where did we go to get that? New Orleans? Yeah. So we flew to New Orleans and uh, it was a pretty prestigious award because it was given to schools from, with physical education. Um, so my parents were very proud of that. And there, Dave and I, with my father, when we were co-directors, so, you know, they were getting on in age and uh, we were taking over a lot of the responsibility. He would come out once a day and coach or teach the competitive, uh, day competitive and boarding students. And Dave took care of that program. So there are the, we had a field program similar to the, you know, camp that's there now in a way. Um, two of our four grandchildren go to Pine Knoll now, by the way. And they've been, what, like five years, I think. Michael thinks he's going to work there someday. Um, these are the plinths that we taught proper stroke technique. And you, on the right, you can see the evolution of the egg. So every time my father got an idea of the strapping or the material, it got better and better and better. And I still use the orange ones. So they must be like 30 years old and they haven't fallen apart yet. This is actually in my backyard pool, uh, just showing the use of the Sylvia egg. And the way that we taught swimming was very individualized. And as I said before, very, very non-traumatic approach it people knew that we ran it that way doctors would send their children and so forth and there's Paul Asmuth he was ranked at one time the top marathon swimmer in the world so my father coached him uh, swim the English Channel and my father had five swimmers that swam the English Channel this is our son, Brian, who's going to be 42, and young Charles Gray sitting next to him. So this is Charlie Gray's son, Charles. So, And then when we sold the property, they had a very nice ribbon cutting ceremony and invited us. And uh, so that was that day. And there's our daughter and Bruce Stebbins. I think some of you know Bruce and Gail was Vicki from Bluebird Acres. She used to work in our office for many years. And of course, all the was Vicky's became excellent swimmers and my husband, Dave. So, and that was the bench that um, we, we bought for my dad. And um, yeah, it just shows you a little bit, a little bit about him. That was the bench for my mother with a tree because she was the, you know, the strength behind the scenes, so to speak. And there it, there it is all in uh, its glory. <laughs> Do you have any questions? Thank you for that. Your dad obviously was a very gifted man, and it's very heartening to uh, hear firsthand the history of uh, the evolution of his program and of Pine Knoll, and um, it's an incredible story, and it's indeed an honor for us to be able to uh, name the pool in his his honor and his memory, and it's just from your story tonight, it is more than well-deserved. Thank you. 
Um, do I have someone who can make that motion this evening? Mr. Anderson. It is my honor to move the town to name the pool at Pine Knoll Recreation Area to the Coach Charles E. Sylvia Pool. I'll second the motion. That motion's been made and seconded. Ms. Richards. Yes. Mr. Page. Yes. Mr. Anderson. Yes. I am a yes. Mr. Kane. Yes. And Mr. Henry. Yes. That motion passes unanimously. Again, we are pleased that we're able to do this on behalf of the uh, town and in uh, honor of Coach Sylvia's dedication to the children of East Long Meadow and surrounding towns. And hopefully as uh, we get some more relaxation of our COVID parameters, uh, arrangements can be made to uh, make the sign and then perhaps we can have a, a gathering, 10 or under, <laughs> to properly install the sign and invite your family uh, to join us. Yeah, and it, thank you so much, everyone. And, and if, it, if it seems that it's uh, more appropriate for next spring or summer to do that, when it, we can do it differently or better or- Right, in a grander that's, class. And, that's yeah. fine too. So, you know, we're patient people. <laughs> well, thank you. And thank you for joining us this evening. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Good night. John, John. I just want to make one final okay. comment, talk about patient people. This is the first time in our history that we've ever officially named a right. municipal uh, site or building or what have you, or structure. This started pretty much uh, when the council was created. Our mutual friend, former school committee member, Bruce Stebbins, he helped spearhead this. Mm -hmm. But we didn't have a, a method to do it. So perhaps it's very appropriate that Coach Sylvia, with his, being an innovator, helped create this innovation oh. with the town of East Long Meadow, dedicates the first one ever to him. And I also want to throw out thanks to our first town manager, Denise Menard, who helped create the backbone that we were able to build off. And a special thank you to fellow counselor Marilyn Richards, who was very instrumental to helping us get to this point as well. Thank you, all well noted. Okay, we can move on now to item 7B and that is the appointment of the Charter Review Committee. Um, as we all know, uh, and for the benefit of our listeners, there is uh, a section in the Charter that calls for a periodic and systematic review of the charter and that specifically is article 9 section 2. Uh, recently in this past uh, year the council adopted a bylaw 10.090 d which uh, calls for the establishment of a charter review committee uh, who uh, will begin the systematic review of the charter and uh, the parameters for that are they must begin their meeting no later than July 1st of the review year and must make a report to the council by March 15th of the following year. The charter review, I mean, excuse me, the bylaw also allows for the president of the council to make an appointment or the appointments. We have advertised for uh, this Charter Review Committee back in March and April. And I'm happy to announce now the folks who will be charged with looking over our charter, making some concerted decisions about adjustments that may need uh, doing. Uh, and I wanna state this is not a rewrite of the charter. It is simply a reaction to the uh, charter and uh, pieces that are working well and maybe pieces that could use a little uh, tweaking. Um, there are 
guidelines for how to appoint uh, folks to the charter committee. Not more than two members can be current town councilors, and they will be Ralph Page and Marilyn Richards. No more than two members can be former charter commission members, and those two individuals will be William Fonseca and Lawrence Levine. No more than two members can be employees of the town. That will be Thomas, Thomas Christensen and Jean Quaglietti, our clerk of the council, who um, by uh, her position uh, will be part of the commission, but as a non-voting member. And finally, at least two members shall be persons who are not current counselors, employees, nor former charter, <clears throat> excuse me, commissioners. And that those two individuals uh, will be Jeffrey Bosworth and Andrew Frazier. I will be meeting with these folks uh, before the end of June to give them their charge and to get them set up, set up. And then from there, they will be off and running. And we look forward to their report uh, as soon as they're in a position to make it. Questions? Good. Happy to move on then. We can move to uh, item eight, public hearings. We have none listed. Orders of the day, licensing matters, again, none listed. Nothing under financial matters. Under old business, the traffic on rural road and a presentation from uh, our DPW superintendent, Bruce Fenny, regarding the uh, of various forms of speed bumps. Ryan, is Bruce with us? Um, uh, he, he called out sick today, Kathy. I'm okay. not sure if he's available tonight. Uh, excuse me, Kathy. Yes. He's, he's not available. He just got back to me. So okay. he's not available this evening. All right. Do we want to, um, I can certainly review what he has here in his report, but I can't comment with any level of expertise. So I'm inclined to want to um, move this to our next meeting so that uh, Bruce is able to qualify some of his estimates. Marilyn? I would support that uh, simply because, you know, based on the information he submitted, I have questions and we've done some research on our, on our own that we'd like to throw out there as possible opportunities to discuss. So it would be, I think, more time efficient if we were all together when we did that. Okay, then I will entertain a motion to table this until Ju June 9th. So moved. Motion. Second. Been made and seconded. Uh, Ms. Richards. Yes. Mr. Page. Yes. Mr. Anderson. Yes. I am a yes on this one. Uh, Mr. Kane. Yes. And Mr. Henry. Yes. Okay, so that motion passes uh, six zero and that will appear again in two weeks on our July. Why do I want to say July? June 9th. Uh, agenda. Okay, moving into new business is the town manager's performance evaluation. I am pleased to report that uh, our council, uh, again at the instruction of uh, the president of the council, in concert with the requirements in our manager's uh, contract, can tell you that uh, in two weeks ago, I asked the council counselors to evaluate our manager's performance on six areas that we identified more or less as short-term goals. Uh, the rating scale uh, was uh, three, three different kinds of labels. The goal has been achieved, the goal is in progress, or the goal should be deferred for a number of reasons, not the least of which is all of our efforts and, and energy have been uh, absorbed with managing the pandemic uh, issues. So that being said, uh, we have unanimous agreement that uh, the manager has developed a, or is in the process of developing a fiscally responsive FY21 budget and capital plan. Uh, and as Mary noted earlier, the finance committee, as well as the capital plan, 
has met weekly for a good six to seven weeks. It is a uh, work with that uh, begs tremendous detail. It's a work in progress. And we know from the state level that the, the Commonwealth's budget will not be in place for July 1. So that means ours cannot be in place prior to that because we will not have accurate figures. So Mary and uh, both committees are working fervently to do the very best possible with that budget. The council has also agreed that the manager has is in the progress in process of creating a succession plan for her position as well as department heads. A third goal was to uh, address um, underperforming personnel and there is nearly unanimous agreement that that goal has been achieved. A fourth goal was to develop organizational charts using a universal template. And these charts, just to give you a little background, is something that we began with our first manager um, at her suggestion because none existed. And it was apparent that as our government and any municipality's government becomes more and more complex uh, over time, that proper flow charts of uh, who reports to who uh, were essential. So the, uh, that has continued in Mary's administration. And uh, again, those are in progress. Uh, the fifth goal was to hire a uh, HR department head. And in theory, the goal is achieved, but in reality, uh, we, the, the individual, there is no individual by name in a permanent position at this time. And it's all related to the uncertainty of the budget. Uh, once we get a budget in place, I suspect uh, our manager will be able to go ahead and recruit a permanent town manager. You should also know that we have an interim uh, HR department head who is working, well, Mary, help me out, 12 to 18 hours a week? 12 and 18. Okay. So I don't want to give the impression we have none, but uh, to, to formalize a permanent position does have to be put off out of necessity of the uh, uncertainty of the budget. And finally, the last uh, goal that we charged Mary with was to fill all vacancies on boards and commissions. That goal has been rated as um, in progress. Uh, much, uh, a number of vacancies have been filled over the last six months but there are still uh, vacancies that need to be addressed on our Conservation Commission as well as our um, CPC Commission. Uh, so overall, um, the council is unanimous that she has done a, a very good job in the short six months that she's been with us. And I'm sure there are days where that you might feel it's been six years. Um, we are pleased with her appointment and we're committed to working with her as we go forward. This is where balloons are supposed to fall down for on the screen now. <laughs> That's probably to be flip about it. I'm just trying to be light about it. Mary, did you want to make any reflections on it or? <laughs> uh, no, just to say thank you for the effort that you all put in to assisting me through these first few months. Uh, I appreciate being here. I appreciate being supported by you. And I look forward to continued progress for the community and for our town employees and staff and residents. And I'm looking forward to the new challenges that we'll be facing together. And so there will you. probably be no shortage of challenges. And so to that end, um, after July 1, when we entered the next annual cycle for evaluation, the council and the manager, and this would be customary for any individual, will mutually agree upon uh, goals to, to uh, set forth and then we'll evaluate down the road. Okay. Okay, we are now down to uh, 
summary action items for next meeting and that would be to revisit uh, the May 12th minutes as well as Mr. Fenney's report. Uh, is there anything else that we want to put on there for action items for the next meeting? Uh, Kathy, sure. um, if Mr. Fenney is going to be in, I'd also like to discuss, we had talked about the Porter Road culvert and I'd like to update on it. Um, back in October of last year, there's a grant to, um, at that time he told us to replace the culvert. And, and that um, was, is that near the entrance to Pine Knoll? Um, to Fenway there? Golf. Okay, all right, okay. Gotcha. And I'd just like to I, let I'm them sorry, know. I'm thinking in my head, I'm visualizing Fenway Golf and saying Pine Knoll. Yes, I know where you're speaking. I would just like to get an update on it. I know uh, he's had to go through conservation and stuff. And I just want to know where we stand with it. Jeannie, can you put that please on the next agenda? Or, yep, sure, for June 9th. Great. And now, uh, anything else, summary items? Could I just add one thing, um, perhaps, and it doesn't have to be decided tonight, but I may have to present to you on your June 9th meeting, or certainly the one after that, um, our operational budget for our 112th budget it has to be yeah. submitted uh, in the month of June and approved Correct. by the Division of Accounts before July 1. Okay, and my last understanding from you was that you were awaiting the template that Department of Revenue wanted all municipalities to use? Yes, it's not available until June 1st, according to the website, so. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm sure we can meet that deadline for, for all of us. Anything else under summary of action items? Okay, then uh, our next item is executive session. And we do have one scheduled this evening for the purpose of discussing strategy with respect to collective bargaining unit, International Brotherhood of Police Officers, Local 482, and the United Municipal Employees of East Long Meadow. I will entertain a motion to move into executive session as well as to return to, exec to, return to open session solely for the purpose of adjournment. I motion to move into executive session for the purpose of discussing strategy with respect to collective bargaining units, International Brotherhood of Police Officers, Local 482, and the United Municipal Employees of East Palmetto, and to return to open session for the purpose of adjournment. Second. Motion has been made and seconded. Uh, Marilyn. Yes. Ralph. Yes. Don. Yes. I'm a, yes, Mike? Yes. And Pat? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Before we move into executive session, I, for the, our audience, we will be back in session on Tuesday, June the 9th. A week from today is our annual town election, and I would encourage all registered voters to either come out and have your voice heard at the polling station at Birchland Park, middle school between three and eight, or request that absentee ballot from our clerk's office, uh, ASAP, and participate in the democracy of our local government. With that said, we will now move into executive session. Thank you, and unanimous. We are out of executive session, and now the motion, I lost my wording there for a minute. The motion to adjourn, please. I'll make a motion to adjourn. A second. second motion. Motion's been made and seconded to adjourn. Marilyn? Yes. Ralph? Yes. Don? Yes. I am a yes. Mike? Yes. And Pat? Sure. Okay. <laughs> then we are adjourned at 729. Oh, 7.30. Just clicked over. And uh, we will see you all again somewhere on screen, either in subcommittees or elsewhere, and uh, have a good evening. You Thank too. You too. Thank, Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night everyone. Take care.